While they weren't the first video games I've ever played, Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal were without doubt one of the most important in terms of shaping my interests and sensibilities early on in life. Pokemon Second Generation was really my first ever experience with getting truly immersed in a video game setting, simply because of how much thought went into crafting the world here. I have nothing against Kanto, which does its job and is more than serviceable as a backdrop, but I look at Johto as the series' first foray into truly telling a meaningful story through setting design and world building, something that would become a sort of trademark for the series, for the next few generations at least. And though I do personally feel as though Sinnoh is the pinnacle of this sort of formula in terms of tying everything together, Johto was the biggest step forward. The revolution to Sinnoh's evolution, arguably containing the more memorable locations, all the while laying the groundwork for this formula for future entries. Now, for a more elaborate description from me on the regional directions those entries went in, I'd recommend checking out my analyses on Hoenn and Sinnoh, which will be linked. In relation, Johto's strengths are a bit different, yet at the same time very similar, especially to Sinnoh. And the key word here for me is richness. This region adds a depth that more than compensates for its size. And what I mean by that is that while it does have far fewer settlements than the other two I've discussed, having 10 to Hoenn 16 and Sinnoh's 14, it has such a rich and focused sense of culture and lore, and its cohesion within itself evokes such imagination and immersion in the player. Add this to the fact that Kanto can be explored after defeating the Elite Four, and the game is just brimming with substance and a flavor that adds personality and layers to the region. A night and day system, locales and a musical score that are more melancholic and poetic in feel, a sense of sheer authenticity to the mythos. I like to use a comparison of the stereotypical birds between generations 1 and 2 as a way of communicating the difference between regions. While the Pidgey line is pretty cool and classic as the traditional bird family, Hoot Hoot and Noctowl just add a different dimension. Something a little darker, a little spookier, a little more spiritual. And that can be found all across Johto. And this substance is accentuated even further in the remakes of the games, Heart Gold and Soul Silver, which did all of this to an even greater degree. With custom artwork for a lot of the major locations in the game, a further enhanced sense of culture due to the visuals, and a great atmosphere that the developers were able to capture once more after their stunning success in Platinum, Heart Gold and Soul Silver were true triumphs as remakes, and for me the primary reason for that is due to how beautifully they understand the draw of their region. Johto is based off of the Kansai region in Japan, which is fitting given that the Johto-Kanto geographical relation is more or less equivalent to that of Kansai and Kanto in real-world Japan. The climate here ranges between temperate and tropical, which is also accurate in the game, so while Johto may not have the extreme heat of places like Hoenn or Alola, it is definitely warmer overall than Sinnoh or Galar. Kansai is commonly known not only as the cultural and historical heart of Japan, but as a core for counterculture, which is a subculture within a larger one whose ideals and views differ from the mainstream. And this sort of idea is particularly prevalent in one of the cities we'll be discussing later. Whereas Real World and Pokemon's Kanto tend to be viewed as rather standardized and uniform in terms of culture and aesthetics, Kansai has a bit more variation from area to area within, and this reflects the contrasts between the two regions in the games as well. There is a great sense of specialization within each town in Johto. While feeling very organic, each town has their own identity, their own landmarks and trades, all of which we'll take a look at later. And as such, Johto has an extremely distinct tone and feel to it, and a very bold identity, despite a subtle and understated spirit. From technological progression, to specialized trades within quiet forests, to bustling ports, there is so much local and distinct flavor from area to area. But for me, the heart of the region is very much authentically Eastern, a heart that focuses on tradition and history. So it makes sense that it's the most traditionally Japanese region in the series, in terms of climate, geography, culture, and atmosphere. 
Out of my three favorite regions, I think that Sinnoh is the most effective in terms of thematic storytelling, immersion, and lore, and that Hoenn is the most creative and vibrant. But Johto has the greatest amount of distinct identity in its culture for me, a true connection to history. Hoenn residents connect harmoniously with nature, and Sinnoh residents connect with each other, with Pokemon, and with the past in a display of sheer gratitude. But in Johto, people immerse themselves in culture and tradition, interacting with history and making a mark on the world. It's an even larger fixation on the past than Sinnoh, more focus in comparison to the latter's breadth and multidimensionality. Almost every area you go to in Johto will have some sort of prominent, unique characteristic or lore tidbit that helps substantiate the region and allow it to stand out, with so many little stories with tons of thought put into them that prop up the mythos. And this element is taken a step further with a feature from the remakes that allows the player to talk with their Pokémon while traveling. In any given environment, your lead Pokémon is able to give a little blurb that often involves them interacting with the environment. Shivering in the cold, splashing in the water, getting tangled in a bush, and it just adds a little bit more charm as the cherry on top. In terms of atmosphere, Johto gives the feeling of a mild autumn town, with the most visually striking places being full of golden browns, oranges, and reds in the northern Ecratik area. Though Kansai does get very warm as I said, I think of Johto as very comfortable in terms of temperature. A late summer or early fall feeling consistently throughout, warm but with an occasional cool breeze, seemingly almost entirely covered by a thick forest and mountain range as the player travels through the multitude of natural caves, thickets, and greenery, with the looming Mount Silver always towering in the background. While not presented in anything close to hyperrealism, the combination of all of these elements make Johto very evocative and immersive regardless. The player begins their journey in Newbark Town, known appropriately as a town where the wind blows and tells of impending change. It's a classic peaceful, quiet, first town-like first town, nestled deep in a forest and south of the mountains, somewhat isolated from most of the rest of the region. The music is legitimately beautiful, being nostalgic to whomever that sort of thing would apply to, and lovely on its own too, adding to the peaceful atmosphere. You can interact with a grumpy redhead if you'd like, but otherwise the NPCs don't give much in terms of world building, and the aesthetics tell more of a story in that regard for Newbark. As I mentioned, nearly every town in Johto has their own trademark thing that distinguishes them visually, at least one element that ties in with the theme of that town. For Newbark, there are the wind turbines, which speak of the winds of a new beginning theme while simultaneously giving the feel of a rural, pretty self-sustaining settlement. Aside from this, the houses are all very simple and wooded, once again giving that small town feel. Yet in the remix, you can hear the sound of the ocean waves outside your house, hinting at an untapped grandness to the setting. On a slightly related note, the sound design in Heart Gold and Soul Silver is fantastic. The audio for footsteps differing depending on the terrain, the sound of wind blowing through the town. It was by far the best and most immersive sound design in the series up until this point, and it adds that extra immersive touch to the journey. Moving west, the player traverses through the forested and secluded Route 29, the road that smells of freshly cut grass, reminiscent of a brand new journey. To the north is a mountain range that spans across routes 45 and 46, but it is inaccessible at this point and will be for a long time. So instead, Cherry Grove City is the next destination. It has the unlucky distinction of being that unremarkable second town, in between a much bigger city and the starting point of the game, and it is probably the least distinctive Johto settlement. However, it does have some identity, and it is a nice transitional area. As the map says, this is a city where you can smell small flowers and a sea breeze. It contains a beach and a view of the ocean, a multitude of flowers blooming throughout, a slightly larger population, the first Pokemon Center and Mart, and a bunch of colorful houses with red roofs, so it really opens the player up to the world immediately, being pretty starkly different from Newbark, yet fitting with the geographical surroundings. If you chat with your Pokemon, they'll amuse themselves through happily sniffing the flowers and playing in the water, or cowering from the water if they're a Cyndaquil. 
The town is full of these subtle little details that work transitionally and subconsciously in a way. So despite not being too notable, Cherry Grove does have some substance and charm to it. Next stop are routes 30 and 31, a grassy path north of Cherry Grove. Mr. Pokemon lives among the greenery, researching Pokemon as a hobby, and the Dark Cave resides here as well as a hint of the more mountainous regions that will become more prominent later on. But west from here is one of the most impressive and iconic cities in the game. Violet City is based on the real-life location of Nara in Japan, obviously residing in the Kansai region. Nara is a city full of shrines, temples, monuments, and festivals that pay tribute to history and tradition, and this is reflected in Violet as well. Known as the self-proclaimed city of nostalgic scents, this is an old village that distinguishes itself through how it is laid out and how the hints of the past remain heavy in the air as you walk the streets. Immediately noticeable are the cobblestone paths that the player walks upon, the lanterns that light the streets. It's a bold visual aesthetic totally different from anything seen in the game so far, which gives a real sense of visual identity to Violet and helps to establish a culture within the town. It's a place that very clearly cares for tradition, embracing past customs and history, which is why, in a lovely little touch, the Pokemon Center and Mart are painted with darker and more muted colors to reflect this traditionality. And the landmark that most accurately reflects both this theme and Violet City is one of the more characteristic representations of Johto, the Sprout Tower. The buildings throughout Johto, and especially Violet, are generally oriental in style, but this tower takes that the full nine yards. As the player crosses the little concrete bridge to enter, past the ponds and lily pads, a sacred tone is immediately felt. According to Word of Legend, Sprout Tower was formed around a large, stationary bell sprout over a hundred feet tall that became the central pillar for the tower. It then became a place of training and worship for the blessings of Pokemon, and only those who defeat all of the praying monks and reach the very top can receive the revered HMO5 Flash. In seriousness, it's a cool concept culturally and symbolically. Flash being the light that guides people to a fulfilling life philosophy, only achievable through what the meaning of this tower is. Working with Pokemon as equals. Everyone is here to pray and worship and pay tribute to the tradition of the tower and the concept of cooperation with each other, Pokemon, and traditions of the past. It's a display of gratitude, and that much is made clear when Silver is scolded for not treating his Pokemon with respect despite completing the challenge. Sound design is once again spectacular here, as you can hear the swaying and creaking of the tower as people battle, that flexibility being a helpful safeguard against earthquakes as well. In terms of wild Pokemon, Sprout Tower is full of common Rattata, but it also contains Ghastly at night. I really like this, not just for some variety and not just because the Ghastly line is one of my favorites, but having a bunch of ghost Pokemon inhabit such an ancient tower in such an old town adds a lovely bit of a haunted aura to the whole place, giving it an extra dimension and really making Sprout Tower and Violet City as a whole feel like an aged town full of old memories and ghosts. West from Violet is Route 36, which connects to the western half of Johto, but is initially inaccessible due to a pseudo-wudo blocking the way. South from here are the Ruins of Alf, another demonstration of a scenic, cultural landmark in Johto. Legend states that 1500 years or so prior to the events of the story, the Ruins of Alf were built by an unknown group of individuals, and subsequently, the first system for reading and writing came to be. Modern researchers believe that the people who built the ruins had goals of coming into contact and cooperating with the unknown Pokemon, and the alphabet is based off of their variations. There are puzzles, wall etchings, and statues throughout the area paying tribute to understanding the Pokemon and the world, and these are the remnants of that era. The ruins brought a large number of people to them out of curiosity, but the unknown were a secluded and wary type of creature who only grew to trust those that discovered the ruins, and so to not disturb them, the place was abandoned. But not before the originators left behind these puzzles to unlock the unknown if needed. 
It's a somber sort of area with a very thick atmosphere, where history can be felt in spite of the travelers and researchers. It's got a sort of inherent weight to it. The ruins of a home of ancient Pokémon, tradition engraved in the stones, a mysterious aura surrounding the place just next to the traditional Violet City. It's an often overlooked location in the games in terms of story importance, but I've always found it to be pretty fascinating. Progressing through the region, the next area south is Route 32, a forest route full of rock faces and fishing spots. It ends at the Union Cave entrance, close by which is a man who will unsettlingly offer you a chance to buy a slowpoke tail, hinting at some near future story events. After hiking through Union Cave, through the tiny and perpetually rainy Route 33, the player reaches the rustic Azalea Town, which is one of my personal favorites. I love Azalea for its very identifiable feel, like a place that has quietly existed for ages, just doing its own thing nestled deep in the Johto forests, segregated so far from any other town. And due to this isolation, it has plenty of distinguishing characteristics. On the outskirts of the town is the Slowpoke Well, a permanent fixture in Azalea's culture that is said to have been created partly due to the common belief that a Slowpoke's yawn can summon the rain. It is said that about 400 years or so prior to the events in the game, a Slowpoke's yawn ended a drought in the area, and so the Pokémon are now deeply respected and have become an identifying characteristic with Azalea. When they aren't being captured by Team Rocket, the Slowpoke can be found all around the town, lazing about near houses, by the well, and just living their lives here peacefully. Another distinguishing factor is the Pokeball service run by Kurt, who makes balls in exchange for apricorns, occasionally attracting people to the town. There's also the Charcoal Kiln, where charcoal is formed from the lumber that the workers and their far-fetched get from the nearby Ilex Forest. And speaking of which, the culture here is not only ingrained in current customs and past traditions, but in myth and legend. It is believed that a forest protector that is grounded to the Ilex Forest's shrine watches over that forest and Azalea, so the people often pay tribute to and appreciate that protector as well. That protector being Celebi, of course. Azalea is very cohesive geographically and economically, with the citizens interacting with the forest in various ways, and basing their businesses around the nearby resources, and overall it's just a very understated village living the only way it knows how. Making a living using the trades that are available, and peacefully coexisting with Pokémon within the forest. The slogan here is a town where people and Pokémon live in simple harmony, and that's a great descriptor for Azalea. Moving northwest, the player makes their way through the aforementioned Ilex Forest, which has such densely packed trees that the forest seems to be in a perpetual night. After passing through that very shrine and the rest of the forest, and after traveling through the short Route 34, we reach the biggest city in Johto, and one of the most significant in the entire series. Goldenrod. Now, there is a lot to cover here, but the first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is a subtle little detail. Goldenrod has a gate that must be passed through to enter. A new aesthetic feature in the remakes is that they have these gates to the entrances of a few towns, the first of which is seen right here. I really like this. It helps give the towns a bit more personality and identity, a self-contained feel, and oftentimes they give a glimpse of what the upcoming town is like through their design. In Goldenrod's case, its yellowish gate is quite modern and imposing, previewing the color palette and theme. Immediately noticeable upon entering is that Goldenrod has a big city feel, not just through the multitude of buildings, but through the many streetlights scattered around town. And this is for good reason. It is one of the largest and most iconic hubs in the series, a seaside city full of industry, community, and thematic significance. Johto revolves around Goldenrod. It has numerous buildings, both commercial and residential, the Game Corner, the Global Trade Station on an offshoot of the western side of the city out on the sea, but the Radio Tower is the main landmark of the metropolis. 
Broadcasting shows and music across the entire region that the player can listen to as well, the radio tower is talked about all through the land. And this helps tie the entire region together and give it a sense of community, while centralizing Goldenrod as the crux. For me, this city is a representation of the duality between technology and progression and authentic culture. According to an elderly man in town, the radio tower is a pretty new building that was erected to replace the old one, and before it was torn down, either the rainbow or silver wing was placed at the top of the old tower. This story speaks of Goldenrod's keen eye for the future, but the idea of the feather demonstrates that it doesn't forget its past. It's a symbolic little story of legacy and shadows of the past, which is again a major theme in Johto that we'll revisit. In addition, there's the Goldenrod Bell at the west side of the town by the ocean and houses, there's the Magnet Train, which connects Johto to Kanto through Saffron City, and the underground path beneath the city, all of which are little contributors to the idea that Goldenrod is a place of connection, between locations both within and outside of itself, between the people that reside in it and in Johto as a whole, and between the past and present. And the city's forward-thinking nature is why I view it as a representation of that concept of counterculture that I mentioned. On a somewhat related note, I find the change in musical theme from the old games to the remakes to be an interesting change in tone. The Goldenrod theme in Heart Gold and Soul Silver is quite upbeat, easygoing, and optimistic, giving the vibe of a thriving city. It's a good song for sure, but the old one was something quite special. It was a little slower, a little more melancholic and somber, a little nostalgic in a sense. It was catchy and appropriate, but it just leaves you feeling a little bit… sad. For reasons that you can't quite place. It's a complex song that makes the player a little reflective, and it just encourages imagination and thought. As such, I personally find it to be a bit more representative of Johto as a whole, and I just think that it gives Goldenrod a little bit more depth in the earlier games. In terms of atmosphere, at least. Just a preference thing, of course. As I said, the newer song is good, too. Working our way north out of Goldenrod brings the player to Route 35 and the National Park. This is a pretty simple route, leading to a lovely and luxurious park that is another highlight of Johto. The music is lovely, and once again a little bit sad in both versions of the game, deepening what is otherwise a pretty simple park in the middle of a forest for people to battle, relax, and spend time with their Pokémon. This whole area, National Park and the adjacent routes, is full of students, so it's kind of cool to imagine it as a hangout or travel spot for these young people just to go and relax in between or after classes. There is also the Pokeathlon attached to the park, which is a fun diversion that's integrated well with Whitney being known to travel there, but it doesn't add too much to the lore of the region for me. After National Park is Route 36, which connects this area to Violet City to the east and to Route 37 to the north once the Sudowoodo obstruction is dealt with. And past Route 37 is perhaps the most scenic and striking area in the game, certainly in terms of official artwork. Ecratique City is incredibly distinct, accurately described by the map to be a place that even now bears the mark of its history. It has a very traditionally Eastern and Japanese flavor to it, which makes sense as it is based off of Kansai's Kyoto region, and the similarities are quite clear. Kyoto is considered to be the cultural capital of Japan, full of shrines, temples, gardens, and landmarks, and Ecratique, with its distinct architectural style, towers, and theaters, is very reminiscent. While Goldenrod is the biggest and most significant city in universe, it could be argued that Ecratique is the spiritual and cultural heart of Johto. Hundreds of years before the events of the story, two towers were erected in Ecratique with the goal of strengthening connections between people and Pokémon. The Brass Tower in the west, which, according to Bulbapedia, is said to awaken Pokémon, and the Bell Tower in the east, where Pokémon rest. Over time, the ancient legendaries of Lugia and Ho-Oh began to call the Brass and Bell Towers their homes respectively. However, after decades of prosperity, the Brass Tower was struck by lightning and caused a fire that lasted for three days until a great amount of rain extinguished it, as if from the heavens themselves. 
Within that fire, it is said that three Pokémon were killed. But Ho-Oh brought them back to life, and they were reborn to reflect the great tragedy. Raikou became the electric Pokémon, meant to represent the lightning that struck the tower, Entei the fire Pokémon embodying the flames that broke out, and Suicune the water Pokémon for the downpour that stopped the fire. They are representations and embodiments of this past tragedy, now embedded in Johto's lore for hundreds of years. A symbol of Ecrotique's history in beautiful Pokémon form, a way for the modern world to connect to the past, and a sad and powerful story for which Ecrotique finds great identity in. And this sense of history and culture, the imprints of this event, are still found throughout the city. The burnt skeleton of the Brass Tower remains untouched, and is now known as the Burned Tower, unaltered out of respect, as a monument of sorts despite being a dangerous place. And within it, the player can find the gym leader Morty and Yusin, searching to uncover the mysteries of legend, hoping for some knowledge. Morty due to feeling that it's his duty to gain a greater understanding of these things, and Yusin due to his fascination with Suicune, due to his ambitions to chase this legend. Now, on the opposite side of town stands the Bell Tower, untouched and splendid. For obvious reasons, this tower is greatly protected, and access is only granted to certain monks and people of grand importance, and to anyone who can manage to get the Ecrotique Gym Badge. Ho-Oh and Lugia both fled the town after the disaster, but legend says that Ho-Oh will appear to a worthy trainer pure of heart, if they climb the tower and hold aloft an item called the Rainbow Wing. As such, certain trainers are granted access in the hopes that this will happen and that the revered Ho-Oh will appear in Ecrotique once more. Again, another example of chasing the past. And likewise, a similar sort of story is true with the Silver Wing and with Lugia's home in the Whirl Islands. The Bell Tower is only accessible after passing through a guarded gatehouse and the adjacent Bellchime Trail, which is a tiny but very impactful route for me. An area drenched in perpetual autumn, surrounded by orange and red trees. It's got a spiritual quality and atmosphere to it with no music, no sound except the gentle crushing of leaves underfoot, as the player walks in preparation for the tower that is simultaneously a home and a showing of appreciation for Ho-Oh. And while the Bell Chime Trail is the place where this autumn atmosphere is most prevalent, the gorgeous golden trees are visible from the city streets too. Combine this with the oriental style of the architecture, the traditions, the Japanese-themed music, the lanterns lighting the streets at night, the fountain and pond, and the buildings that are painted somberly just as they are in violet, and Ecrotique is the most striking and visually iconic town in the game for me, and the one with the richest atmosphere. It's also given depth as a location through NPC dialogue. On a more contemporary topic, it's a hotbed of rumors for areas across the land. For instance, in the Pokemon Center, someone mentions a red Gyarados being spotted in the Lake of Rage. In the streets, another talks about the Pokemon that powers the lighthouse in Olivine being ill. It foreshadows future plot events while adding some cohesion to the relationships and interactivity between towns. And there are even more instances of NPCs deepening the city through discussing myths and history. The elderly debate memories of a flying Pokémon blocking out the sun when they were a kid. Monks speak of legend of a rainbow-colored Pokémon who gracefully flies over the bell tower, or a silver Pokémon gently resting upon a whirling seabed. It really does add up for Ecrotique, and I also like that the Kimono Theatre resides here too, as it's easy to imagine the townsfolk gathering for a night of fun and entertainment in the heart of the city. I personally find it interesting to compare the difference in style between Goldenrod and Ecrotique. Aside from the obvious aesthetic and cultural differences, it's significant that they replaced the old and creaky radio tower in Goldenrod, but kept the dangerous ruins of the old burnt tower in Ecrotique. It's a representation of the key differences between two adjacent cities. One very focused on reflecting the past and remembering, the other more progressive, with eyes firmly set towards the future while not forgetting the past. 
Moving west from Ecritique leads the player towards routes 38 and 39, a meadow full of grassy plains and another example of specialization in the region through Mumu Farm. It's located on the northwest edge of the path, and it is the primary source of Mumu milk in the Pokemon universe, as indicated by the owner as he laments his milk tank being in poor health. If you can nurse it back, you can restore the circulation of milk throughout the entire setting and help out the farm, but aside from this, the route is really not overly noteworthy despite being a bright and breezy plain nestled in between the mountains and sea. But these grassy meadows eventually transition into sandy beach as the player moves south and encounters the coastal settlement of Olivine City. Like Goldenrod and Ecritique, Olivine also contains a gate of sorts at the entrance as well, an overarching string of flags commonly seen in festive port towns, and there are a couple more throughout the city as well. This gives an immediate sense of the identity of the town, which is, as the map describes it, a city where you can hear the melody of the sea. Accentuated by unique stone tile patterns and a distinctive blue-gray-green color palette, Olivine is surrounded by trees and plains to the north, an ocean to the south and east, and by a small beach to the west, and as such, it is known as the primary sea town on the Johto mainland, the place to go for sea breezes and travel. As you'd expect, the place is absolutely full of sailors singing sea shanties by the docks and in the hearty Olivine Cafe, which is specialized towards this sort of demographic. And due to this being the hub of sea transport, Olivine naturally has a lighthouse that has become its trademark, and one of the ever-present scenic landmarks of Johto, the Glitter Lighthouse. According to a lady on the ground floor, the lighthouse is a tribute to Pokemon in the past who used to light the sea at night in order for ships to travel peacefully and in full vision when there wasn't a lighthouse. It's a place full of trainers that is powered by an Ampharos to provide wayward ships with direction, but despite how cool and cohesive it is that a Pokemon's powers are directly tied to the functioning of a major town, during the story of the game, the Ampharos has fallen ill and is incapable of doing its job. This results in the town's economy suffering for obvious reasons, and it causes the gym leader Jasmine to leave her gym vacant in order to care for the Pokemon, rendering her unable to take challengers until Amphi is healed. To help her, the player agrees to travel across the sea and past the Whirl Islands that are talk of legends to Sinewood City, where a famous pharmacy is located. So while Olivine is entirely consistent with the Johto tradition of having a distinct culture and an entrenched lore that looks upon the past, the plot results in a great amount of urgency for the player to get out of there pretty quickly, which may not allow them the peace of mind to get lost in it. But despite the rough waves that surround it, the player is met with a peaceful, quiet hiatus of sorts when they land in Sinewood City, the place where life goes by in tune with the ocean. Like Olivine, Sinewood's identity is intertwined with the sea, but in an entirely different way. What's immediately noticeable upon entering are the seashells that hang on the strings outside of the city, identifying it as a town fundamentally tied to its surroundings. The music here is a very nice display of the spirit of the place, a less culturally distinct yet more soothing and calming remix of the Ecritique theme a much quieter rendition that ebbs and flows as the sea does, and that's kind of what Sinewood is like in a nutshell. But it is a city that the player comes to out of necessity, in order to get the secret potion for Amphi, and that very pharmacy proclaims to carry on the legacy of 500 years of tradition and medicinal secrets passed down through the generations, which distinguishes Sinewood further and ties into that theme. But the town is much more multidimensional than that. With its tranquil and calming atmosphere, you can see that the place is full of people just appreciating the gentle melody of the waves and living a peaceful life, with thrills coming from the hushed whispers of excitement talking about myth. Both citizens residing here and sailors stopping by alike talk of the mystical islands and whirlpools between here and Olivine, and of the legendary creature that supposedly inhabits them. Additionally, during the player's stop here, they bear witness to Suicune at the northern cape of the island, right before it flees by riding the waves of the ocean. All of these elements, as well as the gym, substantiate Sinewood well. It isn't just a port in the storm, 
and thanks to the mystique and connection to such interesting stories and lore, it is a place steeped in historical and contemporary importance. Additionally, it's worth noting that in the remakes, Sinewood contains a cave entrance leading to Johto's version of the Safari Zone. Originally, Sinewood wasn't a very popular tourist spot due to its isolation and how difficult it is to get to, without much reward in return. As I said, despite how significant it is historically and thematically, it was often just a resting spot for sailors laying anchor for a night before continuing their journey. The gym and pharmacy were the only real draws to it, and even that wasn't enough to make it stand out, apart from the stories, of course. However, in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, a man named Bauba opens up a brand new safari zone and Pokemon reserve, and he advertises relentlessly for it, leading to more people circulating to Sinewood to experience the attraction. The cliffside path to the safari zone is a nice little location as well, scaling the side of the rocky face of the island, open to the sea, and enhanced by some beautiful music. After this stop in Sinewood, the story requires that the player works back through central Johto, east of Ecratique City, to continue. This leads them to Route 42, a stuttering route interrupted by ponds and rocks, as well as the mountainous expanse of Mount Mortar. This is an optional but nonetheless important geographical location from Johto, primarily due to how it begins the pattern of rougher terrain going towards the late game northeast section of the map. But after this, the player enters the relatively low-key settlement of Mahogany Town. While the music here is pretty mellow and welcoming, it is juxtaposed by the fishy and suspicious atmosphere that can be felt immediately upon entering the place. The town is said to be a settlement of ninja ancestry, and this can be felt through the ninja towers jutting from the trees that surround it. This adds to a shady feeling at this point, which makes sense given the unnatural radio waves emanating from Mahogany that cause the Pokémon up at the Lake of Rage to act strangely. As you'd expect for such a small village, the conversations with the townsfolk mostly tend to revolve around the happenings at that lake. It is one of the highlights of Johto, and so they conflate this local attraction with Mahogany's identity in a way. And this lake can be visited too. Up north from Mahogany is Route 43, a woodland path full of trees, where Team Rocket's influence has traveled as well. Here, they block out the straight path for trainers, charging exorbitant fees for simple passage. The other path towards the left is much more wild and natural, and both eventually lead into the wilder still Lake of Rage. The place is super atmospheric, with the raging rainstorm and the swelling music giving a tone of rough adventure. And that rain, which was added in the remakes, is a nice touch to add to the chaotic yet somber atmosphere of the story. It's a somehow quiet, raging storm, a sad one. According to the fishing guru, the Lake of Rage is a crater in the earth that was formed by a number of raging Gyarados. The crater eventually filled with rainwater and became what we see today, and the lone red Gyarados driven to fury by Team Rocket is reminiscent of that story that has passed through the ages. It used to be that you could always catch Magikarp here, but Team Rocket's radio waves have forced them to evolve. The place is very naturalistic, very organic, with a slew of trees having been submerged in the lake forming a natural maze of sorts. The area in general just feels very sacred, despite kind of being a tourist spot. Only surrounded by a couple of huts housing the fishing guru and a strange meditative man, the Lake of Rage is just very evocative through the significance and thematics of the place, using these elements and the atmosphere in a way that transcends the hardware. I personally think it's reminiscent of Sinnoh in a way, which is fitting given that this is one of the most northern areas of Johto, and that Sinnoh is stated to be just north of here. After visiting the lake, the player is sucked into a grand adventure to stop Team Rocket, first through their hideout in Mahogany, and secondly during their takeover of Goldenrod City and the Radio Tower. And these events are indeed significant, but I just ask that you wait a little bit before we dive into why they're so contributory to the themes of the region. After all of that is taken care of, the player can go east from Mahogany across Route 44 to progress. 
It's a nature-focused path, laden with grass, ponds, and mountains, continuing the introduction of the rockiest part in Johto. The route then leads straight into the Ice Path, a mini-dungeon that is by far the coldest location up until now. Although it would have been nice to have a bit more visual transitioning as we get to the cave, maybe a bit of snow, perhaps some strong winds, the dialogue with your Pokémon on this route makes up for it, as it shivers and snuggles up to you when you talk to it, indicating that you're entering a very cold place. On the other side of the Ice Path, we get to the final settlement in the game, and one of the most important, Blackthorn City. Continuing the geographical theme slowly established east of Ecratik, Blackthorn is a town carved into the side of a face of a mountain, according to the map. Being at or near the peak of the mountain, Blackthorn is not for the faint-hearted. It's a rough place, with rocks and dead, barren trees strewn across town, and along with the sheer height and infertile ground, this really gets the impression across that this place is pure nature. Despite the stream flowing through the town, and the small pond behind the gym, it's by far the most outwardly unfriendly place, aesthetically at least. It's full of serious trainers who go to the ice cave or the surrounding areas to hone their skills, a solemn training ground where a cold, harsh wind blows through. In a manner consistent with the rest of the other areas in Johto, Blackthorn also has a deeply entrenched theme a sacred culture and tradition revolving around dragons. From the dragon-type gym run by Claire to the Dragon's Den, a cavern and shrine of sorts revering the mythical Pokémon, generations of worship run through this land. It is said that a clan of trainers who command dragon Pokémon live here, and as such, there are many stories and legends of dragon Pokémon in town, with all dragon tamers apparently coming from Blackthorn, and with Lance hailing from here as a master. This dragon identity is a cool bit of integration as well. The connection to Lance makes the world feel a bit more cohesive, and the fact that these tamers often venture into the ice path to train makes a ton of sense given that ice is the natural weakness for dragon types. But while I did mention that this place is cold and harsh in terms of climate, geography, and aesthetics, the soul of it is very heartfelt. The Dragon's Den is a place full of secrets, a training ground where access to the Elite Four is granted to the player, and a place where Lance is known to go quite often. The elders there test prospective trainers about their values to judge whether or not they're worthy of the honor, yet the key here is that criteria for passage is not pure strength, but ideals. The trainers are tested to see if they truly care and appreciate Pokémon as equals. One cannot pass this test without showing respect for both tradition and the creatures, and that in itself puts a ribbon on Johto very nicely, as a place that continuously offers this idea of appreciating Pokémon through the many differing themes and cultures of its towns. South of Blackthorn is a rather treacherous mountain path that is impossible to both scale and totally explore in one go on the way down, due to the harsh terrain. But it all circles back to your hometown of Newbark, and as fate would have it, to the entrance of the Pokémon League. After a short surf east of your own house, the player takes their first step into Kanto to take on the League Challenge, and through connecting to the region that they've likely explored and had many adventures with in their past, Johto concludes this ever-present theme in a somewhat meta way. And even further down the line, the player is able to take on Red atop of Mount Silver, the towering mountain that had been present but untouchable up until this point. In doing this, they truly connect with the past in every way, facing the protagonist of previous games, and as such, I think Mount Silver represents this idea of Johto succinctly. It's a region that lives and dies by the lore and history, and how the current world pays tribute to and yearns for that distant past. And through coming into contact with the literal past region of Kanto, Johto, and the story of the game as a whole, comes full circle here in the most appropriate way.
While this idea of history, appreciation, and culture is prevalent throughout the entire Johto region through the elements I described, I don't believe that it truly resonates as much as it can unless we examine certain other story elements and how they make these themes more impactful. I already mentioned the Ecritique legend, and how the three legendary dogs are representations of Johto's past and identity, but there's a bit more to them than that. The legendary Entei, strong and regal. The poetic and lyrical Suicune, gliding across the waves. The graceful Raiko, so powerful yet so nimble that one can imagine it gently racing from cloud to cloud during a storm. It is said that these Pokémon fled upon being resurrected by Ho-Oh, knowing their own power and seeing people regard them with fear and ignorance, the thought of coexistence frightened them. However, in the game, the pure-hearted player is capable of catching them and connecting with them. And in doing so, the representations of the past find a way to connect and exist in the present through compassion, and strive towards the future in a completed world. It is also said that Lugia and Ho-Oh fled Ecritique after the disaster due to the growing distance between people and Pokémon. But likewise, the player can connect with both in the game. As Bulbapedia puts it, they yearned for a person to touch the hearts and souls of Pokémon once more. And that's what the player does. And through doing this, we are able to be a representation of all that Johto is in the process of making the region whole through bringing these Pokémon back into the fore. These creatures, who represent the past, are shown kindness and welcomed into the world by the player, in a display of appreciation for tradition and history. And this emboldens the culture of the place by demonstrating what Johto is about. But this dynamic frontloads a very important addition to this idea that was touched upon in the Dragon's Den and Sprout Tower. That of respect. Pokémon are so deeply ingrained in the culture of the world and the customs of each town, so entrenched in the citizens' way of life, that even if they don't maintain life or existence as Palkia and Dialga do for Sinnoh, if they were gone, people in Johto would be lost. There's an ever-present theme of interacting with history, of making our marks on the world. Regular people in towns, going about their lives wanting to carry on and maintain tradition. Yusin, who constantly strives to learn more about Suicune in an endless journey. Those who celebrate Ho-Oh in Ecritique and impatiently wait for its return, and those who whisper tales about Lugia on the shores of the deep blue sea. People have a tendency to chase those mysteries, those myths, in an attempt to reclaim the joys of the past, and Johto as a whole signifies that to a huge degree. And through contrast, this idea is capitalized on through Team Rocket's role in the story, and how this role is explored through their motives. After the disbandment of their team three years ago in the previous games, they try to take it upon themselves here to rise up from the ashes, in the hopes that Giovanni will come back and properly revive them. In doing so, they reflect the themes of the region, but in a detrimental and desperate way, one that is void of that which makes the theme truly resonate. They're living off of legacy, living in the past, trying so hard to revive past glories but they're ultimately unable to do so. And that's partly because of them not being strong enough in the end, but there is also thematic symbolism here. The relics of the past throughout Johto display a sense of togetherness and gratitude, but most importantly, the legendaries do as well. They represent times gone by, but had fled from the modern world. The people of Johto earnestly yearned for them, but it takes the player, a person of pure heart, to bridge the gap. It takes kindness, purity, and a positive embracing of the past to maintain it in the future. And that is something Team Rocket never had. They were selfish, glory-seeking, not planning to do anything good with their power. And that is why they could never win. Similar to this is your rival in the game, Silver, who begins the story desperate to become the strongest, and eventually reveals a deep desire to defeat Team Rocket. Silver is the son of Giovanni, and was very likely nurtured to not believe in meaningful connections or respect for Pokémon due to his upbringing, which formed his personality. 
He continuously loses to the player and continuously wonders what he's missing. He trains harder than everyone, he strategizes, he picks the strongest Pokemon, but he can never win when it matters most and is consistently desperate for victory out of fury. And those around him, Lance, the elders in Sprout Tower, they all tell him that he has no respect for Pokemon and that that is his weakness, but it takes until very deep into the game for him to actually realize what he lacks. And from then on, he begins treating Pokemon with more respect, becoming a true trainer and in the process, gaining much more value from life. That was the missing link for Team Rocket and for him, why they were unable to achieve what they set out to do. And that element is what allows the player to bring everything full circle in this region. In this sense, it's pretty fitting that the second generation were the games that introduced the concept of friendship evolutions. We have a tendency of chasing after the past, of idealizing nostalgia and carrying on patterns. But without a sincere respect for that past and the world around us, our cause is lost. Now, although all of these legendaries remained hidden due to the distance between them and people, most of the citizens in this setting live in this appreciative way. It just took the player to provide that extra push for the region to be restored with its past in the way that so many desired it to be. The main theme of Johto is interacting with this idea of historical culture, but this sense of pure respectful intent is ingrained in every blade of grass, every rock, and every living being in Johto. And without it, it wouldn't be anywhere near as beautiful as it is. Many thanks for watching.